What have you lost? In the course of your life, in the battle against sin, death, and the devil, to which every human being is joined from their conception on, what have you lost? See, every human being made in the image of God, as the scripture tells us, is trapped in that battle. Even the people that willingly, openly, knowingly serve the forces of darkness, even the people that are deluded and unbelieving and serve in the armies of Satan in this world, what they've lost is immeasurable because of their foolishness, because of their lack of faith. We all lose. That's key to being born into the flesh, into a fallen and sinful world. All of us will lose the pound of flesh, all of the poundage of all of our flesh, no matter how many donuts we may have eaten. We will lose it all to an unbelieving, dark, satanic, deaf world. We're all joined in it because we're made in the image of God. Whether minions of Satan or servants called servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are all part of the struggle on one side or another, and it will have its flesh, and it will have its spirit. It will drain us of every bit of life that it possibly can before the battle is over. It hits us when we're children, when we get our first cold, when we have our first flu, when we have our first skin, knees, or cut and shed our first blood. It attacks us from the instant we've existed. Some suffer conditions in the womb. Some die. Some are stillborn. Others are deformed. There's no escaping from the fallenness of the world. From the instant of our conception, every effort of the sinful world, of sin with a capital S, of the devil and his minions is to kill us, to undo life. No wonder abortion is one of the great victories of the age for the devil. It's what he wants, after all, to snuff out life at the beginning, if possible, to prevent it altogether, to destroy it. Because he is anti-life, anti-God, anti-Christ. And our life as Christians means we're aware of the struggle. We're aware of it in a way that we can know what the world has taken from us. Because we were born in an imperfect and fallen creation. Not the one in our very long reading from Genesis. The perfect creation before the fall when everything was under the dominion of humanity, when we were good and pure and virtuous, when nothing died whatsoever. Plants would lose their seed before they were eaten, and life begets life. The fruit carries the seed inside of it. You eat the fruit, and the pit goes to the ground and grows a new tree. In a creation of perfection, where there's no pain, suffering, death, misery, no loss, nothing ever ceasing to exist, But you and I, because of the fall, were born into a world where if we're inevitably in time, we bury our parents. We bury our loved ones. We watch them suffer and we suffer. We progress from our childhood colds and fevers to diseases and the failure of our organs and the inevitable ravages of what the world calls inevitable time, but what we know is from lingering in this world so long in the darkness of it. The longer we're here, the more our body is ravaged and the more our spirit cries out in torment, saying, when will it end? When will it be over? When will the liberation of the world come? I was thinking of this with our gospel reading because of the father who's terrified for the death of his son. Notably, this happens in Cana in Galilee, where the first miracle of Jesus was performed, no less than transforming water into wine. The God who will turn wine into his blood, the God who will turn the water of the font into the blood of the Passover lamb, the God who will break the tomb and raise the dead, he follows up the sign of the miraculous transmutation of water by fixing the child before it's too late, by snatching him from the jaws of death. 
in some manner, this is sort of surprising. Not because it's an incredible miracle, not because the boy will go on living, but there's sort of a, a curse attached to it almost that we don't think of when we read the joyousness of the text. Like, like poor Lazarus, who had been dead so long, they said, lo, he stinketh, was forced to return to this world. And he was not transfigured. He wasn't resurrected in the sense of Christ's glorification. Lazarus came back to his family and his loved ones well enough so that someday, blessedly, he would get sick and die from something else. Back to a world of suffering. Why would Jesus return Lazarus to a world of suffering rather than let him go to paradise? Why would he raise the widow's son? Why would he raise this boy? Why would he do this repeatedly, return people to the world? And the answer is, despite all of the agony of existing in a fallen world, life is still good. Life is still blessed. Life is still created in the image of God. We are. Life is breathed into everything by the Holy Ghost and it has value. To fight this fight is to suffer and to be miserable and to inevitably to leave this world. But to be part of fighting this fight is to stand against the forces of darkness and say that this thing that we call life matters and that every moment in our suffering and our misery and that whole list of everything this world took from us well, it couldn't have taken it if we never had it. God fills our lives with blessings of our family and our friends and our loved ones and all of the good things that the devil keeps tearing away from us. And if all we did was focus on the things we lost, we would be lost. We would be wretched. We make our way through a world where our families die, where our families break up, where our children don't speak to us, or our children go wayward. We live in a world of stealing and robbery and murder. If we're really lucky, we avoid all that really bad stuff and have only the day-to-day -day struggle against our own flesh and the million agonizing things that happen in an imperfect world. But our very life is a testimony against all of that. The real victory is every moment that we find love and peace and goodness and the gospel, and see the image of Jesus in each other and in other people. To be able to look into the foul maw of the world and say, for this Jesus died, because Jesus counted it as being valuable. He brings back the man's son and the widow's son, and he raises Lazarus as a testimony, not to give them their final ideal outcome that will be later, but to against the world launch that offensive that says no life is important it matters it's good it's holy and it will inevitably triumph the raising of each of these people is a foreshadowing of christ's own resurrection the man in the gospel is god the father who says my son is dying but by the power of the holy ghost the resurrection makes him alive again and in christ's case that cancels out all the power of sin, death, and the devil. Everything we suffer here, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as Shakespeare called it, the misery and pain of our flesh and our spirit are counted as nothing compared to the triumph of God in Christ. It is only a temporary pain, a temporary discomfort, and a temporary thing leading to joyful reunion, joyful eternal life, joyful new creation when all things are made right when finally we enter that sabbath rest with christ who slept in the tomb that says it is finished and on the seventh day god rested by his bursting of the tomb that new creation is born and it lives and it lives in us it lives in us by the one who raises the dead who transforms the water who transforms the bread and wine who by his word spoken washes away our sin and destroys all darkness to make way for his light. In Jesus' name, amen.